All right. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from around the world today. Uh, welcome to the Arab News Research and Studies Briefing Room webinar titled, What Next for the Children of Daesh Detainees? Featuring commentary from Save the Children UK. Now, today's conversation revolves around one of the research unit's briefing reports of the same title, written by Dr. Azim Ibrahim which focuses on the very real risks and dangers states uh, have for disregarding their international legal obligations towards children of foreign Daesh members detained in Syria and Iraq, with some 7,000 minors living in al Hol camp in Syria alone, and many warning that they could become ticking time bombs if not dealt with properly. Now, for those of you who haven't read, haven't had the chance to read the report or will be interested in reading it after this conversation, please find it in the link below. Uh, joining us today are Dr. Azim Ibrahim, a director at the Center for Global Policy and author of the book, The Rohingyas Inside Myanmar's Genocide. Uh, alongside Dr. Azim is Orla Minogue, a senior conflict and human humanitarian advocacy advisor with Save the Children and a specialist on the conflict in Syria. Now she has a decade of experience working on human rights and humanitarian law and policy with a focus on protecting children in conflict. Now we're aiming to have a 30 minute conversation with our guests and we'll allocate a further 15 to 20 minutes afterwards for questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A function found on your screens below and submit your questions. We hope to be able to answer all the questions, but given the time constraints, we can guarantee that all of them will go through. And now without further ado, I'd like to kick off this conversation. Uh, Dr. Azim, can you please take us through a brief summary of your report that you've written? Uh, thank you so much, Tarek, for having me. A uh, great honor to be on one, one of your panels again, um, uh, particularly with somebody like Orla, who's doing some fantastic work in this region. Um, uh, so the report is essentially based on some of my own primary research, which I undertook last year when I traveled to Turkey and uh, Syria to some of the refugee camps. So my research was primarily around the refugee situation and how some of the foreign uh, you know, personnel from ISIS are holed up there. And I made very grim reading and, um, uh, you know, I, I traveled to the camps and uh, I met with lots of the refugees. Uh, the camps completely varied in terms of how they composed. Some of them were extremely poorly constructed, uh, shockingly poor, and uh, some of them were in a much better state. But uh, overall, you know, the situation with the children of uh, ISIS detainees in particular is quite precarious and I think this for me was uh, you know uh, was an unambiguous situation in terms of how to deal with that. I think there's a huge debate around ISIS fighters themselves, ISIS females in terms of their um, uh, in terms of their involvement, the extent of their involvement in the ISIS organization and whether they still radicalize or whether they can be de-radicalized. But I, I focused on the children issue simply because I don't think there's much ambiguity around that. I think all, everybody accepts that these children are completely innocent. Uh, many of them were born in Syria and Iraq. Many of them were born in the refugee camps. Many of them were actually just brought over by families at a very young age, and uh, they are now in their teens. And, uh, and I, I think almost everybody accepts that they are the innocent parties in this, uh, in this conflict, and they should be repatriated to their countries of origin as soon as possible, because long term uh, for them to be situated in the camp long term is not just detrimental to them, it's actually detrimental to our security over the long term. You are essentially now grooming the next generation of ISIS radicals. And this has actually been significantly complicated because the Iraqis and the Syrians, whence they may be these, these individuals, do not recognize them as uh, you know, as local citizens, they were un, un, unwilling to obviously give them, you know, Iraqi nationality or um, uh, you know, passports or Syrian, and the foreign governments are unwilling to recognise them. So you have literally a stateless generation that is growing up in these camps, and uh, and the situation as it stands in the camp, you know, many of the individuals are, are still huge, you know, significantly radicalised. Uh, many of the people that I spoke to, a lot of the females, in fact, are actually waiting for the resurgence of ISIS to come and free them uh, so they can go back to life under the caliphate. Um, so we have a situation in which you have young people growing up in this extreme radical and extremist environment. And I felt I focused on the children specifically because I wanted to ensure that, uh, you know, the children are repatriated. I don't think there's much ambiguity around that. And I think there's just a number of 
options that we in the West actually have, and, and I can go through them at a later time. But you have essentially 70 countries, uh, individuals from over 70 countries. So this really was a global uh, phenomena of, uh, of individuals traveling to the ISIS land. Most of them uh, are situated in northern uh, Syria and the, uh, under the control of the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, which is essentially a Kurdish, uh, Kurdish group. Uh, 13,000 um, uh, of them are, are, are children, up to 13 to 13,500 are, are children that have come outside from Iraq or, or, or Syria. And uh, I think Western governments have simply turned a blind eye to this because there are legal complications in terms of separating children from the parents. Uh, you know, how can you repatriate a child without repatriating its mother? And, uh, and I can talk about a bit more about them, uh, you know, throughout the discussion. But uh, essentially, the bottom line was that I think this is an unambiguous issue, and I think this has to be dealt with on an urgent basis by all Western governments. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Azim. Uh, it's quite extraordinary figures, uh, to be honest. Uh, Orla, can you please uh, give us your comment and your take, as well as your thoughts on this? Absolutely. Thanks for having me and thanks to Dr. Azim for both his paper and for that overview there. Um, I would certainly agree that the children we're speaking about here should be repatriated. And what I thought might be helpful in reflecting on some of the things that have been mentioned is to go into a bit more detail about the conditions that children are facing in these camps on an everyday basis and have been now in some cases for you know, um, a couple of years, a number of years. Um, so I think, first of all, it's, it's important to understand the group that we're talking about. As you said, there's a, these are really big numbers. Um, I'm going to talk about foreign children particularly, and by that I mean children who aren't Syrian or Iraqi, because those children are, are treated distinctly within the camps that we're speaking about here in northeast Syria. Um, and of those foreign children, uh, they're treated differently from others within the camp. They're located separately um, in what we call annexes, so in distinct sealed off areas within the, within the, two, the two camps that we're, we're speaking about here. Um, and they suffer stigmatization, unclear status, lack of pathways around reintegration, a number of issues across all manner of, of of um, their basic human rights, basically. Uh, throughout the camps, critical gaps exist across all sectors. So water, sanitation, hygiene, health, nutrition, education, and protection. And even though, you know, if we take the case of Al Hol camp, which is, you know, extremely large, there's 64,000 people there. It has been in operation for a number of years, but was originally established for approximately 10,000 people. And then in the space of two, three months in, in 2019, saw an influx to this number of 68,000. So I think you can imagine it's been a game of catch up ever since for the humanitarian actors and camp authorities that are in charge there, which goes some way to explaining why there is such, um, you know, consistent strain on the provision and the services available in the camp. This isn't um, a neat and orderly refugee camp, the like of which we have seen in a number of humanitarian disasters around the, the world. Um, this is these, this camp and in its smaller sister camp, Al Roj, are, are you know, quite unique in, in their setup. Um, and so, as I say, then that means that services are totally overwhelmed and severe overcrowding obviously exists in the camp as a result, which greatly increases the risk of communicable diseases, something we're all very concerned about at the moment. And deaths linked to poor health and sanitation continue to be registered in the camps every week and month. And that's separate even to, to COVID-19, which of course exacerbates all of these risks. Our colleagues have reported seeing children who are bow-legged, which can be the result of a vitamin D deficiency, children's teeth are rotting, it's those broader medical issues that, you know, over a period of time can become quite debilitating for children. Um, and while the exact cases of COVID-19 numbers are unknown in the camp, there are fears that it could be spreading undetected when you have very little testing. It's very hard to know what you're, you're facing. There was the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the camp last August. Um, and there have been some, uh, sadly, some confirmed cases since, but we still are waiting with bated breath what might come in the months ahead, which I think speaks to the urgency of what we're talking about here. 
Um, on top of that, you may have seen reported in recent weeks, there's been a state of murders in the camp, um, which is, speaks again to the urgency of just how unsustainable the situation is when you have many thousands of children essentially living out their childhoods in this dangerous, volatile situation. Um, maybe because I don't want to take up too much time, I know we want to get to discussion to say that absolutely agree with Dr. Azim that repatriation is what's key here for these children. Um, it's not only the best course of action, practically speaking, it's also morally the best course. And it's been demonstrated multiple times to be feasible. Um, unfortunately, we did see a drop in the number of children repatriated from about 600 in 2019 to actually close, more like 700 in 2019 to close to 200 in 2020. Now, part of that can be accounted for because of the restriction measures in place to control the spread of COVID-19, which of course makes perfect sense. But it also speaks to a bit of a worrying trend, I believe, that, you know, there, there's a sense and a false sense that this is a sustainable situation in these camps. Um, and I think if you look closely at the conflict in Syria, the situation in the Northeast, never mind, say, looking at the, the health provision restrictions within the country, you know that it's not a safe place for any of these children. Um, I'll finish up by saying that it's never in the interest, best interest of a five-year-old child to languish in a camp with no services among armed groups in a conflict zone. And for as many as 4,000 of these foreign children, that's what they are, they're, they're less than five years old. Um, and Dr. Zim rightly pointed out, very many of them have been born there, some in the camp themselves. And the idea that they know nothing else, I think is very sad, particularly when they have countries of origin that can, um, you know, that's been demonstrated can repatriate them. We know that that's the best opportunity for them in terms of reintegration, rehabilitation, um, and we have been in, proud to care for children inside Syria that have been repatriated to their home countries. And we get progress reports of, of young kids flourishing essentially back in a, in, a, in a safe and healthy environment outside of that conflict zone. So that's what we would like to see for the rest of the children who remain there. Um, we don't believe the repatriation policy should be limited solely to unaccompanied or orphaned children or to a cumbersome case by case approach that has been taken on by, um, you know, a number of states. It's been demonstrated repatriation is feasible and we think all of these children, uh, including those who with their mothers are innocent victims of this conflict and should be repatriated to their home countries um, with urgency. So I'll leave it there for now and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Orla. Uh, very insightful and very needed uh, knowledge for everyone who's listening in. Um, now, I wanted to ask a question to you, Dr. Azim, uh, which also could be getting input from uh, from Orla. Now, the case with, with to the children of Daesh detainees, the thing is, it's particularly tricky due to the fact that, as mentioned in the report, repatriating children could mean essentially separating uh, these children from their mothers, who are just as guilty as their husbands, in regards to their support for the terrorist group. Now, what is the best plan of action to deal with this? Um, if families are repatriated at the end of the day, more likely than not, the mother uh, will be jailed and th thus um, separating her from her child either way. Uh, so what, what kind of way can we get around this? Sorry, Dr. Azim, can you hear you? Yeah. Sorry, uh, so this this is actually one of the one of the great complications in terms of uh, under international law. How do you separate a child from its mother? Uh, so you either you have to repatriate both the child and the mother. And as you clearly indicated, that uh, many of these women themselves are are guilty of crimes. Uh, some of them may have been innocent victims, but we simply do not know. And public opinion will simply not allow uh, any politician to make a decision in terms of repatriating these individuals, these adult individuals who actually went to, who, who, who traveled from the West, to, from Europe uh, to ISIS territory voluntarily. In France, for example, they did undertook a survey and 89% of people were against the repatriation of adults, uh, even if they were imprisoned, uh, they were tried and imprisoned, and 67% uh, of them were against the repatriation of children. So this is actually one of the great complications. I, I think one of the possible ways that we should be looking at this is that uh, there have been cases of uh, women, uh, females are willing to give up their children uh, if they are repatriated to their extended family, so possibly to their grandparents and uh, or other members of their families, their siblings, or uncles and aunties who can then take who can then take their child. So they themselves voluntarily give up 
uh, the child without much uh, coercion, simply because they realise that the, the children are not going to have a, a, a you know productive life in, ca in the camps, and the, the reality that they are not themselves going to be repatriated anytime soon. So they themselves are willing to give that up. And I think as, as unfortunate that as, as that may sound, we have to put the interest of the child at the forefront. And this is just my personal belief. Uh, and I think those kinds of options should be explored further, uh, giving uh, that voluntary uh, giving up the child. Uh, the second thing I would say is that there have been uh, uh, cases uh, within within Syria itself, within within Syria, of uh, uh, almost like uh, halfway houses in which children are actually removed from the camp and put into what are essentially like boarding schools. And there was one in particular that we visited called the Hori Center in Kamishli. And this is a uh, as an institution which is it's like a boarding school the children are removed from the camps they're put in a safe environment in which they're given you know regular kind of education regular kind of grooming uh to kind of de-radicalize them the parents can still visit uh, but under controlled circumstances and i think as a compromise this is actually a, a quite a good solution uh, in terms of trying to get the children out of the camp uh, environment so i think uh, projects like that require more funding more support more examination and could be not perfect solutions but certainly better than children going up in camps in which they are actually being thoroughly radicalized and in which they are living in conditions um, uh, which are simply not suitable for children but i think the, the, there are significant complications with with all of these uh, all, all of these measures but there are no good solutions that will be acceptable uh, to the public and there are no good solutions that any politician would be willing to willing to kind of undertake or push. Thank you, Dr. Azim. Uh, Orla, I, I have a actually I have a question for you uh, regarding this uh, in specific because um, we look at children in the sense in the structural sense of the fact that uh, they are minors. They are from zero, let's say, infants to uh, eighteen year olds. But th by that, by the definition of a child or a minor, now. What about those that are 19 and 20, let's say they, they, they have spent their most one of their most crucial foundational and developmental years uh, under this in these camps and under this like ruled by such an ideology. Um, what 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 about them? What uh, are they considered or treated as uh, children? Uh, well, by international legal standards, I don't believe so. But uh, are NGOs or humanitarian ag agencies and groups um, doing something? Uh, about that. Thanks for the question. I think it might be helpful actually if I address the previous question and then go into that because it'll it'll shed some light on our thinking on this. Um, so I would and say the children would absolutely agree that the best interests of the child are of paramount consideration in any conversation about repatriation in any decision affecting any child. Um, in fact, um, and. The humanitarian uh, sector, I suppose, and the child rights sector have developed best interests assessments that allow us to make decisions about, along with other actors, to make decisions about what those best interests might be. What I think is crucial, though, in this circumstance is that that, that kind of assessment and that kind of analysis can't take place in camps in northeast Syria because that, the environment doesn't allow for it. This, you know, the service, the infrastructure doesn't allow for it. And so we would argue that any decisions about what happened between mother and child, so whether that comes to separation of mother and child, when it comes to the prosecution of women, when it comes to determining culpability, all of these big issues that we're grappling with here, which are absolutely very complex and sensitive, we think that should happen back in their country of origin, in capitals where there are the services and where there are the professionals who are able to make those determinations. And so say the children is calling for all of the foreign children to be repatriated, including those who are with their mothers along with their mothers. So to as far as possible, um, because again, this is hugely contextual, hugely complicated situation. But I think that all those determinations of what we're talking about, the fact that we don't know, you know, what has brought particular women to Syria. Many will have been trafficked themselves as children. Many will not and be on a completely, off, you know, another end of a spectrum. So, you know, very much understanding that. But I think those assessments need to happen. 
um, in the country of origin where there where there's the ability to do that. So with that in mind, then we are calling for all children and their mothers to be repatriated. So it isn't it you know I think that maybe goes some way to answering your question about what about 19 year olds, what about 20 year olds? Um, that question of trying to understand what brought people to to Syria and and how is 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 a, is a key question very many of what are now adults will have been brought as children or will have been groomed and recruited to come as children and we have a huge body of research analysis on children that are associated with armed forces and armed groups and a lot of best practice about how to work with these young people and how to you know rehabilitate and reintegrate them but unfortunately that conversation seems siloed into one group of what people imagine those children to be and it doesn't necessarily get applied when we're talking about um you know young adults in inside syria in these camps so um that's what i would say about you know people who have reached adulthood is is that question of, of how they came to be there Thank you, Orla. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. Um, now, Dr. Azim, uh, in, your, in your report, you mentioned Article 7 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and how no child can be made stateless due to the circumstances of both their birth or state policy. Now, however, we have seen many cases and just so uh, of, of negligence toward their rights. Uh, what are the repercussions that states are likely to face, if any, uh, for disregarding uh, the convention as well as their international legal obligations. Article 37 of the same convention also states that no child shall be subjected to cruel, inhumane, or disregarding treatment and deprived of his or her liberty arbitrarily. But as Orla mentioned, um, the cases and the situation within the camps are beyond, uh, beyond inhumane. Uh, can you please comment on that? Yeah. So in terms of what repercussion states are, are, are you know, possibly going to face because of uh, the breach of these articles, I, I would imagine very little repercussions. Uh, many of them are stripping their nationals of these of their own passports and their citizenships. Uh, so by definition, their children are, are, are made stateless as well. And uh, they've done that particularly in the UK with dual nationals, people that held uh, British and other nationality so the you know the home office has stripped them of their british passports uh, so they're technically not stateless which is actually illegal you cannot make somebody stateless um, uh, so they've got around that by by um, uh, stripping them just off their british british passport so the children are by definition become stateless as well and i think the, the real complication here is that uh, you know politicians and, I, and i've had a discussion with various politicians on this topic you know, they, they, their reluctance to repatriate individuals is just comes down to a political calculation that look, if any of these individuals come back and even one of them is involved in some sort of terrorist activity, some sort of attack, a knife attack on the streets of London or Manchester or elsewhere, the first question that will be asked is that why did you allow these people to come back? And, uh, you know, the politicians that I spoke to told me that I will have to then answer to their parents um, uh, you know why I let these individuals in, and uh, you know one of the one of the things that I proposed, uh, you know, um, uh, many years ago at the very early stages of when when the Daesh Caliphate was coming to an end, is that uh, we, what you know what I thought was was one of the one one of the better solutions is to have essentially an international tribunal set up uh, to the highest legal standards in Iraq uh, uh, or Syria, and obviously in Syria it's, it's not feasible, but. Uh, in Iraq, this is, this is completely feasible to set an international tribunal to the highest legal standards. Uh, so Western governments, European governments can negotiate, uh, work with the United Nations. So there's no death penalty, uh, which is not acceptable in Europe. And there's no um, uh, evidence that is obtained from torture or coercion. And the reality is, is that, uh, and I've always believed this, and I believe it's still the case, you know, if we repatriate any of these individuals, the probability of them being imprisoned or, going, or having a fair trial is, is very slim. The reality is, is that uh, the British police, the British security services, simply do not have the wherewithal and the evidence to prosecute, the, prosecute those individuals. Whereas the Iraqis, on the other hand, um, uh, their intelligence service is trained by the CIA. 
They have their cell phones of every single one of those individuals. They know from the geolocations and from their chats and their, you know, the social media activity exactly where they were at what point. So when massacres and mass graves were being prepared, they know exactly who was actually there. All of this information that the Iraqis do have. They've always have a gold mine of information from the number of detainees that they've detained, tens of thousands of them, and can build up a very accurate picture. And most of this evidence is not permissible in a, in a British court or a European court. So if those individuals were to return to the UK or return elsewhere, uh, you know, at the most, they'll get a very soft prison sentence and they'll be let free. Whereas the Iraq, if they were, you know, whereas if they were tried in Iraq, there's much better evidence base. And I think the Western governments can work with the United Nations, work with international criminal court, work, work with other bodies to create these kind of tribunals because the current situation is simply not sustainable is to just leave all of these individuals in camps and then just disregard them. You know, this is not a long term solution at all. The tribunal solution, which I think some countries were keen on, I think is much more viable. But I think the best, the most strongest argument for me for the tribunals, having tribunals in Iraq rather than allowing these people to be repatriated, uh, and I'm talking here about the adults, is the fact that, you know, these people, many of them have traveled from all over the globe come to Iraq, come to Syria, and have committed gross atrocities against those peoples, against those individuals. And those people in Iraq and Syria deserve justice. They deserve justice and they deserve to see justice being done. And for these people, these criminals then to leave the country and go to the back to their home countries and get what will only be interpreted as a soft prison sentence and then go through a de-radicalization program and then get living off state benefit or whatever, you know, this is denying people that have been uh, victims of gross, gross crimes, is denying them justice, and that is simply not tenable, and it's simply not acceptable. You know, we have to ask ourselves the questions that if somebody came into our country and committed those kinds of crimes, would we, be, would we allow them to then be returned to their own country and serve a soft prison sentence? Would that be acceptable to us? It won't be acceptable, and neither we sh should we deny the Iraqi people, the Yazidis, and many of the other minority groups, the Shias, um, uh, and even the Sunnis in, in many respects to deny them justice. So I think th my own proposition is that all the children should be repatriated without question, um, uh, you know, through any means possible. If they cannot be repatriated, I think we should look at halfway house solutions. Even moving them one or two miles down the road from those camps in Olivole or Olivole or just much better than having them in the camps, put them in these uh, boarding houses. And I think all the adult individuals should be tried with international legal standards, uh, with tribunals that are supported by the West, uh, by the United Nations, and should be tried and sentenced accordingly. And if during those tribunals, abs make it absolutely clear that it is found that they're in, they are innocent of any crime, they are coerced or they were not involved in atrocities, then, then absolutely let's, uh, let's repatriate them back to their home countries in Europe. But until the people of Iraq and Syria see justice, and have justice served and can look their, uh, look their perpetrators in the eye in a courtroom, I don't think this idea of repatriation should be, should be explored. Thank you, Dr. Azim. Orla, now, if you have any comments uh, regarding that, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, a couple of comments to add. So I'm absolutely in agreement that, of course, accountability for crimes is, is key. Um, unfortunately, we have seen almost uh, 10 years into the war in Syria, that accountability for crimes in Syria is, is not easily forthcoming, but is absolutely crucial. Um, to reflect on some of the, the issues raised, I think, yes, there has been, I'm aware of discussions around the potential of an international tribunal. Um, and while I can see the um, the value in that and the, and the attraction in that idea. I think our experience of international tribunals of that type to date have suggested that it takes several years in the establishment of tribunals, several years in evidence gathering. Um, these are not short processes, as we know, and we've, we, you know, it's not long that we're still seeing some of the outcomes of the uh, Rwandan and Yugoslav um, tribunals. And so, this is a very long process and, and given we're in a situation where we have these women and children in camps that are unsustainable, we don't, we don't currently foresee a reality in which it could be possible for them to stay there for, for several years longer. Not just the fact that 
for children, of course, that's a hugely important time, developmentally speaking. Very many states do not want to separate mother and child as they know this is not good practice. Um, and they know that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to gain informed consent for any kind of separation of mother and child in the conditions that they live in. Um, but also because of the, of the insecurity of the camps themselves. So for example, if you take the US administrations, which have repatriated almost all of their citizens, it has been on both humanitarian and security grounds on the fact that they, they don't believe that the Kurdish administration currently has the capacity to maintain these huge numbers, particularly given the instability in, in Northeast Syria. Nobody knows what 2021 or 2022 is going to hold for, the, for that area. Um, I think there's very mixed views, very understandably, amongst people who have been victims of such crimes. But we, ha we do know that for some, they would prefer to see people repatriated back to their home country and prosecuted for crimes than to see them in camps where they don't know where they're going to be in one year or two years. Um, so it's a very complex picture. Um, and uh, the bottom line is accountability is, is key, absolutely, but also time is of the essence. And these conversations have been ongoing for a couple of years so far with no progress on the idea of an international tribunal. So it does make, it does make me concerned about the kind of longevity of what we're talking about here. I think the long, the long period of time when it comes down to accountability isn't, isn't an issue. Justice is worth the wait. Um, but in the meantime, we have these very vulnerable children suffering in the camps every day. So it's a difficult one. Thank you, Orla. Um, now I'm gonna go to, to a couple of questions we got from uh, via email. Um, the first goes to Dr. Azim. Um, France is going through a case by case basis of repatriating children but that would seemingly take too long. So what is the best way states to go about repatriating children? Is there a faster way than going case by case? Yeah, I, I, w w once again, um, uh, you know, I don't know the intricacies of international law, uh, you know, separating women, uh, you know, mothers and, and, and children. Uh, case by case basis is simply not sustainable. I, I, I personally believe that, uh, you know, a, a situation, we, we have to arrive at a situation in which all children are repatriated and removed from the camps. I think absolutely no question about it. Um, uh, case by case basis is simply not feasible, simply not workable, and the damage will have already been done with many of them. You know, many of these children are now in their teens and, and you know, you post their teens. Um, uh, so can you even de-radicalize them now? I think that's a question that's up for up for discussion. So this case by case basis, I, I suspect is just a mechanism to kind of kick this problem down the, uh, you know, uh, just, just essentially kick it down the lane and uh, for countries not to actually deal with it directly. I don't think it's feasible. Uh, I, I, I simply believe that uh, you know, it has to be full repatriation of children, whichever means. And we have to understand that there have been a lot of children that have been repatriated in this situation. Uh, many of them have actually been paid. Some of them with that wealthier kind of family members have managed to smuggle themselves out. Uh, you know, have, have turned up to their home countries and they're not getting a lot of media coverage, but I've met with journalists who have told me that they've interviewed this person or that person who's kind of made it back and just disappeared. And the, obviously the, the, the Western uh, governments are not keen on highlighting this, the vulnerabilities of their society. So, but there have been multiple cases of that. So I, I, I think this case by case basis situation is simply not feasible and it's not realistic either. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Azim. Uh, Orla, there's one for you. Uh, what is the most the NGOs can do in these camps, given the restrictions that could be imposed by the Syrian government or the Iraqi government, for example, as well as the difficulties in obtaining funding for everything necessary for these children, especially with regards to uh, de-radicalization? Thank you. Um, so there is a very uh, concerted humanitarian effort underway in the camps to meet the basic needs of this population who are entirely reliant on the authorities in charge of the camp and humanitarian organizations present in the camp uh, to survive. And so Save the Children, for example, provides education services, prote child protection services, nutrition services, um, and provides non-food items for people as they needed, for example, winter clothing and blankets, etc. Uh, so we do a wide array of programming. Um, we do have difficulties around accessing this 
population, not least because of restrictions related to COVID-19, um, which, which, you know, has, we've still been able to reach people, but of course have needed to adapt our programming to make sure we can do so safely. What I would say is that it's not enough and it's, it's never enough. And that is in part because of the layout of these camps, because of the restriction and the ability of what can be provided. So for example, in terms of healthcare, there is basic healthcare provided in the camp, but it's very difficult to um, provide referrals for those who have additional health needs to access healthcare outside the camps in Northeast Syria. Syria is a society that has been decimated by a decade of conflict. So all Syrians face massive challenges in accessing the kinds of services that they need. This is just additional barriers on top of that for people within the camps. So um, hence the challenges and, and hence the inability to make the camps fit for a standard that would make this sustainable. That's what we always say. So while we're there to provide the best services that we can and we call on governments to continue funding, to respect the rights of this population and to try and make sure that their, their needs are met, it also, it's never going to be in a situation where it's an appropriate childhood. You know, it's never going to be safe enough or clean enough or access to enough water. That's, that those, that's the limitations of living in a, in a camp like this, in an environment like this. Um, but certainly we're working in capitals around the world and you know, at the, the UN in, in Geneva and New York to really make the case for just how vulnerable these, these children are. And I think sometimes when we're talking about such huge numbers for this non-Syrian, non-Iraqi group, we're talking about uh, 8,000 children, sometimes taking out the story of one children is what has that impact in one child sorry has that impact in terms of making it it, it real and some pictures their own three-year-old and then they imagine the three-year-old in the camp and so we try to do that the best as, as we can um but obviously this is a very complex conversation with all of the issues that we've been talking about here so you know recognizing the sensitivities that states have about talking about this this population um it's it's never an easy topic but one that we feel is is very important to make definitely thank you very much dr azim and orla for your very insightful comments now for everyone watching whether it be by zoom facebook twitter or youtube uh, and would like to read the report you can find it on arabnews.com research um, so i thank you very much again dr azim and orla and everyone who has been uh, watching have a good Thanks day. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.